unfortunately crashes marred another stage of the Tour de France this year, particularly two big ones at the end. This was supposed to be the first regulation sprint stage from Lorient to Pontivy, 183 kilometers long, and there's a descent in the last eight kilometers. You notice right before the finish, and then the run into the line in the last three to four kilometers was extremely technical into Pontivy. So with the rain about, potentially a very dangerous finish for the riders, and the sky turned as black as my mood after this stage. But when they rolled out, it wasn't too bad. Ida Schelling in the polka dot jersey, although Matthew Van der Poel actually had more points than him, he would of course get into the break with I think still a little barter once again. And the first crash of the day, notice in the overhead shot, Ineos are in front of Jumbo Visma. And then next thing we know, and this is like with 150 Ks to go, nothing on, Grant Thomas goes down. Now there was a speed bump beforehand. Kwiatkowski or someone flared their elbows to warn him. And only a couple of riders went down behind him. And it was those Jumbo Visma riders behind him. Hersink crashed really heavily, hurt his head and his collarbone. He immediately abandoned. Grant Thomas was lying on the ground once again, crashing. The third time he's crashed in like the last six weeks, Romandy, Criterium de Dauphiné, the osteopath apparently put his shoulder back in, it had been dislocated. Tony Martin caught up once again. He rode back to the Peloton quickly, although understandably incredibly frustrated after his stage one. And Grant Thomas, they picked him back up. And so that inattention from him or the handling error or whatever it was for Thomas, which to be honest is the biggest red flag for him, can he make it through three weeks safely? He got back on the bike and it didn't seem to cost him straight away with Luke Rowe dropping back and the rest of the Ineos team, Castroviejo, etc. They didn't drop back Carapaz and Port, obviously. And so with so much left in the stage, Thomas made it back fairly easily. But we'll see how banged up he is tomorrow and for the TT on stage five, where he's got to hold that TT position and his shoulder might affect it. But the rain started coming down pretty hard in dribs and drabs on the breakaway. And Edith Schelling jumped out of that breakaway group to take the maximum points. Only one point available on the fourth category climb. He dropped out of the breakaway with his job done. That was the last climb of the day. Waved goodbye to his breakaway companions, thanks for the ride, and went back to the peloton with his jersey safe for tomorrow. Meanwhile, in the peloton, they were coming up to the first intermediate sprint of the day. But I want you to focus on Mark Cavendish. He's on Merku's wheel, and he gets his wheel on the wrong side of Merku. We saw Merku in stage six, UAE Tour. He likes to leave a rider and a half's width to his right-hand side to allow his sprinter to go up the right-hand side. Drops them off super late. He did it with Bennett. And then that means that the sprinter behind Cavendish really has no chance to come through. Instead, Cavendish elects to go to the left-hand side of Merku. Merku doesn't really know where Cav is, has to open up more space for him, and Ewan wins the intermediate sprint in a couple of pedal strokes ahead of Cavendish. But with the run into the finish, this stage started to get really hectic. Wout van Aert, Tony Martin, Lotto Sudar with Philip Gilbert, Casper Asgren for De Kernick Quickstep. They were all presenting at the front of the race, trying to stay in front on these narrow roads until all of a sudden we see Primoz Roglic crashing for the second time in three days, straight onto his tailbone. And this is blowing up on Twitter because Roglic said that Sonny Colbrelli in the Italian National Champs jersey body checked him and you can't really see what happened exactly from the front on images. You need to see it from the helicopter. Sure, it looks like Cole Brelli moves over and there might be contact with Roglic. Was there space to Roglic? Where were their wheels overlapped? Has someone to the right-hand side of Cole Brelli pushed him and moved him over? So until we see the overhead helicopter shot, I'm not sure we need to start a witch hunt for Sonny Cole Brelli. I think the bigger questions for Jumbo Visma and Roglic were, why wasn't he on Wout van Aert's wheel? He lost Wout van Aert's wheel on the front right of the peloton earlier for seemingly no reason. He's caught behind with Koos, Vingegaard, and Kreuzweig. Wout van Aert wasn't with those four riders for Jumbo Visma. He was elsewhere. So that's the big question for Jumbo Visma. They got Roglic back on maybe his bike or Vingegaard's bike and started pacing him back. But this was with like eight Ks to go. No way they were going to get him back. And they didn't drop back Wout van Aert, interestingly enough. They may be trying to keep him there on GC to take yellow after the TT. They just dropped back Mike Turnison. The question was, how much time was Roglic going to lose? Next thing we know, there's this sharp left to right hand bend and another crash. Jack Hay goes down really hard with Arnaud Demar, other riders involved as well. Tade Pogacar 
Focus on him in the bottom right of this screen in a white young rider's jersey. Pagacha has maybe nine lives or it's handling as well. He's grown up riding a bike all his life. Not only to avoid crashing, but then to be not caught up or have a mechanical or just be able to keep riding and not even unclip just about. Incredibly lucky for Tade Pagacha. And that meant that Roglic was going to get caught up behind that melee as well. But to be honest, when you see how sharp this left right was, how close it was to the finish, it's a descent as well on a sprint stage. Just a super dangerous corner. And it's a real shame to see Jack Haig having to abandon the Tour de France in the form of his life. But this was the front group that was left. It had Richard Carapaz in it, but no Mark Cavendish. Jumbo Visma joined forces with Movistar trying to pace back Miguel Angel Lopez and Roglic. And Alpes and Phoenix had the numbers. They had this cyclocross guy leading them out initially. Then with 750 to go, Jonas Ricard, Philipson, Merlier overpowered lead out train. So Ewan and Sagan are really going to try and move up as much as possible. They know Tim Merlier is the fastest man left in this group apart from Caleb Ewan himself. He's got the best lead out and he's in the best position. So there was a massive fight for Merlier's wheel. You can see Bol and Sagan getting into it, trying to fight for that one wheel. Ewan's trying to squeeze through as well. Nasser Bouani's on the barriers behind Case Bol at the moment. And it's actually Sagan and Ewan who are able to force their way through to get onto Merlier's wheel, who's being led out by Philipson, who won a Welter stage in a sprint last year. The man is seriously quick, won Shell de Preis this year. But there's a right-hand bend at this point, and Alpes and Phoenix, as they should, go the shortest line round. Ewan crashes and takes out Sagan with him. We'll come Come back to that in a second with some analysis, but Tim Merlier wins for the 1-2 Alpes and Phoenix after Mathieu van der Poel won yesterday, shushing maybe the haters. He wouldn't say afterwards in the post-race interview, but here's this crash with Caleb Ewan. You're probably wondering what happened. It looked a bit weird. You can see how this is a left to right bending chicane in the last 200 meters. And Philipson is going to get to this bend, which you can just see out of shot here, and he's going to leave enough space to his right-hand shoulder, and Merlier is going to go in a straight line, following the lane, following the bend. Merlier did nothing wrong, and that is going to cut off Ewan's line just a little bit, because Ewan's come the long way around that bend, trying to get onto Merlier's wheel, fighting with Sagan for it. And you can see, as Merlier starts to go straight here, through the following the bend, Ewan is about to get his front wheel overlapped with Merlier and he clips that front wheel right about now that bucks his bike and he's going to go right into Peter Sagan and nothing Sagan could do obviously so Ewan unfortunately I think he's done his collarbone as well he's abandoned the race so just a messy last 10 kilometers and obviously congrats to Alpes and Phoenix and Merlier for that huge win but it was just so hard to get excited for it after all the crashes Lopez and Roglic came over about a minute and 20 later losing more time so the big winner of the day even with Thomas crashing is actually Ineos they're back in the game completely Pagacha obviously escaped largely unscathed losing a bit of time but not too much here's the final stage results Merlier, Philipson, Buani, Ballerini, Colbrelli, Alaphilippe, Van der Poel, Boll, Turgis and Volscheid he keeps the yellow jersey though Matthew Van der Poel and GC now Van der Poel first, Alaphilippe on eight seconds he was in the front group too Carapaz into third on 31, the same time as Wout van Aert, then Keldman, Pagacha, Mas, Quintana, all largely on the same time, and then Latour, Igita. But to be honest, this stage has left me feeling pretty flat. Let me know how you feel about it all down below. It's hard to get excited about the GC battle when guys are just going down left, right, and center.